United States, Barack Obama. Good afternoon, everyone. Please be seated. As I think everyone knows by now, this first U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit has been the largest gathering we've ever hosted with African heads of state and government, uh, and that includes about 50 motorcades. Uh, so I want to begin by thanking uh, the people of Washington, D.C., for helping us host this historic event, uh, and especially for their patience with the traffic. As I've said, this summit reflects the reality that even as Africa continues to face great challenges, we're also seeing the emergence of a new, more prosperous Africa. Africa's progress is being led by Africans, including leaders here today. I want to take this opportunity again to thank my fellow leaders for being here. Uh, rather than a lot of prepared speeches, our sessions today were genuine discussions, uh, a chance to truly listen and to try to come together around some pragmatic steps that we can take together. And that's what we've done this week. Uh, First, we made important progress in expanding our trade. The $33 billion in new trade and investments that I announced yesterday will help spur African development and support tens of thousands of American jobs. With major new commitments to our Power Africa initiative, we've tripled our goal and now aim to bring electricity to 60 million African homes and businesses. And today I reiterated that we'll continue to work with Congress to achieve a seamless and long-term renewal of the African Growth and Opportunity Act. We agree that Africa's growth depends, first and foremost, on continued reforms in Africa by Africans. The leaders here pledge to step up efforts to pursue reforms that attract investment, reduce barriers that stifle trade, especially between African countries, and to promote regional integration. And as I announced yesterday, the United States will increase our support to help build Africa's capacity to trade with itself and with the world. Now, ultimately, Africa's prosperity depends on Africa's greatest resource, its people. And I've been very encouraged by the desire of leaders here to partner with us in supporting young entrepreneurs, including through our Young African Leaders Initiative. I think there's an increasing recognition that if countries are going to reach their full economic potential, then they have to invest in women. Uh, their education, their skills, and protect them from gender-based violence. And that was a topic of conversation this afternoon. And this week, the United States announced a range of initiatives to help empower women across Africa. Our new alliance for food security and nutrition continues to grow, aiming to lift 50 million Africans from poverty. In our fight against HIV-AIDS, we'll work with 10 African countries to help them double the number of their children on life-saving anti-retroviral uh, anti drugs. And even as the United States is deploying some of our medical first responders to West Africa to help control the Ebola outbreak, we're also working to strengthen public health systems, including joining with the African Union to pursue the creation of an African Centers for Disease Control. I also want to note that the American people are renewing their commitment to Africa. Uh, today, uh, Interaction, the leading alliance of American NGOs, is announcing that over the next three years, its members will invest $4 billion to promote maternal health, children's health, and the delivery of vaccines and drugs. So this is not just a government effort. It is also uh, an effort that's spurred on by uh, the private sector. Combined with the investments we announced yesterday and the commitments made today at the symposium hosted by our spouses, that means this summit has helped to mobilize some $37 billion for Africa's progress on top of, uh, obviously, the substantial uh, efforts that have been made in the past. Second, uh, we address good governance, which is a foundation of economic growth in free societies. Some African nations are making impressive progress, but we see troubling restrictions on universal rights. So today was an opportunity to highlight the importance of rule of law, open and accountable institutions, strong civil societies, and protection of human rights for all citizens and all communities. And I made uh, the point during our discussion that nations that uphold these rights and principles will ultimately be more prosperous and more economically successful. In particular, we agreed to step up our collective efforts against the corruption that costs 
African economies tens of billions of dollars every year, money that ought to be invested in the people of Africa. Uh, several leaders raised the idea of a new partnership to combat illicit finance, and there was widespread agreement. So we decided to convene our experts and develop an action plan to promote the transparency that is essential to economic growth. Third, we're deepening our security cooperation to meet common threats from terrorism to human trafficking. Uh, we're launching a new security governance initiative to help our African uh, countries uh, continue to build strong professional uh, security forces to provide for their own security. And we're starting with Kenya, uh, Niger, Mali, Nigeria, Ghana, and Tunisia. During our discussions, our West African partners made it clear that they want to increase their capacity to respond to crises. So the United States will launch a new effort to bolster the region's early warning and response network and increase their ability to share information about emerging crises. We also agreed to make significant new investments in African peacekeeping. The United States will provide additional equipment to African peacekeepers in Somalia and uh, the Central African Republic. We will support the African Union's efforts to strengthen its peacekeeping institutions. And most importantly, we're launching a new African peacekeeping rapid response partnership with the goal of quickly deploying African peacekeepers in support of UN or AU missions. And we'll join with six countries that in recent years have demonstrated a track record as peacekeepers. Ghana, Senegal, Rwanda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Uganda. And we're going to invite countries beyond Africa to sh uh, join us in supporting this effort because the entire world has a stake in the success of peacekeeping in Africa. In closing, I just want to say that this has been uh, an extraordinary event, an extraordinary summit. Uh, given the success that we've had this week, uh, we agreed that summits like this can be a critical part of our work together going forward, a forcing mechanism for decisions and action. So we agreed that the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit will be a recurring event to hold ourselves accountable for our commitments and to sustain our momentum. And I'll strongly encourage my successor to carry on this work because uh, Africa must know that they will always have a strong and reliable partner in the United States of America. So with that, I'm going to take a couple of questions. I'm going to start with Julie Pace of Associated Press. Where's Julie? There she is. Thank you, Mr. President. There's been a lot of discussion surrounding this summit about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and there's an untested and unappro unapproved drug in the U.S. that appears to be helping some of the Americans who are infected. Is your administration considering at all sending supplies of this drug if it becomes available to some of these countries in West Africa? And could you discuss a bit the ethics of either um, providing an untested drug to a foreign country or providing it only to Americans and not to other countries that are harder hit if it could possibly save lives? Well, uh, I think we've got to let the science guide us. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't think all the information's in on whether this drug is helpful. Uh, what we do know is that uh, the Ebola virus, uh, both currently and in the past, is controllable if you have a strong public health infrastructure in place. And the countries that have been affected uh, are the first to admit that uh, what's happened here is, is that their public health systems have been overwhelmed. They weren't able to identify and then isolate cases quickly enough you did not have a strong uh, trust relationship between some of the communities that were affected and public health workers. Uh, as a consequence, uh, it spread more rapidly than has been typical with uh, the periodic Ebola uh, outbreaks that have uh, occurred previously. Uh, but uh, despite, obviously, the extraordinary pain and hardship uh, of the families and, and persons who have been affected, and despite the fact that we have to take this very seriously, it is important to remind ourselves this is not an airborne disease. This is one that can be controlled and contained very effectively if we use the right protocols. So what we've done is to make sure that we're surging not just U.S. resources, but we've reached out to European partners and partners from other countries, working with the WHO. Let's get all the health uh, workers that we need on the ground. Let's help to bolster uh, the systems that they already have in place. Let's nip uh, as early as possible uh, any additional outbreaks of the disease. Uh, and then 
During the course of that process, I think it's entirely appropriate for us to see if there are additional uh, drugs or medical treatments uh, that can improve uh, the, uh, the survivability uh, of what is a very uh, deadly and, and obviously brutal uh, disease. So uh, we're going to — we're focusing on the public health uh, uh, approach right now because we know how to do that. Uh, but I will continue to uh, seek information about uh, what we're learning uh, with respect to these drugs going forward. If this drug proves to be effective, would you support fast-tracking its approval in the United States? Uh, I think it's premature for me to say that because I don't have enough information. I don't have enough data uh, right now to, to offer an opinion on that. John Carl, ABC News. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, when you were running for president, you said, quote, the biggest problems we're facing right now have to do with George Bush trying to bring more and more power into the executive branch and not go through Congress at all, and that's what I intend to reverse. So my question to you, has Congress's inability to do anything significant given you a green light uh, to push the limits of executive power, uh, even a duty to do so, or, or put another way, does it bother you more to be accused of being an imperial president pushing those limits, or to be accused of being a do-nothing president who couldn't get anything done because you faced a uh, dysfunctional Congress? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, I never have a green light. I'm bound by the Constitution. I'm bound by uh, separation of powers. Uh, there's some things we can't do. Congress has the power of the purse, for example. Uh, I would love to fund uh, a, a large infrastructure pro uh, uh, proposal right now that would put millions of people to work and boost uh, our GDP. Uh, we know we've got roads and bridges and airports and uh, you know, electrical grids that need to be rebuilt. Uh, but without the cooperation of Congress, what I can do is speed up permitting process, for, for example. I can make sure that uh, we're working with the private sector to see if we can uh, channel investment into much needed projects. Um, but ultimately, Congress has to pass a budget and authorize uh, spending. Uh, so I, I don't have a green light. What I am consistently going to do is, wherever I have the legal authorities to make progress on behalf of middle class Americans and folks working to get into the middle class, whether it's by making sure that federal contractors are uh, paying a fair wage uh, to their workers, uh, making sure that uh, women have the opportunity to make sure that they're getting paid uh, uh, the same as men for doing the same job, uh, where I have the capacity uh, to uh, you know, expand some of the student loan programs that we've already put in place so that repayments are a little more affordable for college graduates. Uh, I'm going to seize those opportunities. And that's what I think the American people expect me to do. Uh, my preference in all these instances is to work with Congress because not only can Congress do more, but it's going to be longer lasting. And you know, when you look at, for example, congressional inaction, and in particular uh, the inaction on the part of House Republicans uh, when it comes to immigration reform, uh, here's an area where, as I've said before, uh, not only the American people want to see action, not only is there 80 percent overlap between what Republicans say they want and Democrats say they want? We actually passed a bill out of the Senate that was bipartisan. Uh, and in those circumstances, uh, what, what the American people expect is that uh, despite the differences between the parties, there should at least be the capacity to move forward on things we agree on. Uh, and, and that's not what we're seeing right now. So uh, in the face of that kind of dysfunction, uh, uh, what I can do is, you know, scour our authorities to try to make progress. Uh, and we're going to make sure that every time we take one of these steps that uh, we are working within uh, the confines of my executive power. But uh, I promise you the American people don't want me just uh, standing around twiddling my thumbs and waiting for Congress to get something done. Even as we take these executive actions, I'm going to continue to reach out to Democrats and Republicans, to the Speaker, to uh, the, uh, the leadership uh, on both sides uh, and in both chambers uh, 
to, to try to come up with formulas where uh, we can make uh, progress, even if it's incremental. Do you believe you have the power to grant work permits to those who are here illegally, as some of your supporters have suggested? What I certainly recognize uh, with respect to immigration reform, and I've said this in the past, uh, is that um, we have a broken system. It's under-resourced. And we've got to make choices in terms of how we uh, allocate uh, personnel and resources. So if I'm going to, for example, send more immigration judges down to the border to process some of these unaccompanied uh, children uh, that uh, have arrived at the border, then that's coming from someplace else. And we're going to have to prioritize. Uh, that's well within our authorities uh, and, and prosecutorial discretion. My preference would be an actual comprehensive immigration uh, law. Uh, and we already have a, a bipartisan law that would solve a whole bunch of these problems. Until that happens, I'm going to have to make choices. Uh, that's what I was elected to do. Margaret Teller, uh, Bloomberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, along the lines of executive authority, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew uh, has previously said that the executive uh, branch of government doesn't have the authority to slow or stop corporate inversions, the practice that you have called distasteful, unpatriotic, et cetera. Um, but now he is reviewing options to do so, and this is an issue that a lot of businesses, probably including some of the ones who were paying a lot of attention to this summit, are interested in. So what I wanted to ask you was, what prompted this apparent reversal? Um, what actions are now under consideration? Will you consider an executive order that would limit or ban such companies from getting federal contracts? Uh, and how soon would you like to see Treasury Act, given Congress's schedule? Just to review why we're concerned here, uh, you have uh, accountants going to some big corporations, multinational corporations, but that are clearly U.S. Best based and have the bulk of their operations in the United States. Uh, and these accountants are saying, you know what, we found a great loophole. Uh, if you just flip your citizenship uh, to another country, uh, even though it's just a paper transaction, uh, we think we can get you out of paying a whole bunch of taxes. Well, it's not fair. Uh, it's not right. The lost revenue to Treasury means it's got to be made up somewhere, and that typically is going to be uh, a bunch of hardworking Americans uh, who either pay through higher taxes themselves or through uh, reduced services. And in the meantime, the company is still using all the services and all the benefits of uh, effectively being a U.S. corporation, they just decided uh, that uh, uh, they, they go through this, uh, this paper exercise. So uh, there is legislation working its way through Congress that would eliminate some of these tax loopholes entirely. Uh, and it's true what uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Lou uh, uh, previously said, uh, that we can't solve the entire problem administratively, uh, but what we are doing is examining are there uh, elements to how uh, existing statutes uh, are interpreted uh, by rule or by uh, regulation or tradition or practice uh, that can uh, at least discourage some of the folks who may be trying to take advantage of this loophole. Uh, and I think it's something that would really bother uh, the average American. Uh, the, the idea that uh, somebody uh, renounces their citizenship but continues to entirely benefit from uh, operating in the United States of America uh, just uh, to avoid paying, uh, paying a whole bunch of taxes. Uh, we'll, we're reviewing all of our options as usual uh, and, and uh, related to the answer I gave Jonathan about executive actions. Uh, my preference would always be uh, for us to go ahead and, and get something done uh, in Congress. And keep in mind, it's still a small number of companies that are resorting to this, because I think most uh, American companies are proud to be American, recognize the benefits of being American, uh, and uh, are responsible actors and willing to uh, pay their fair share of taxes uh, to uh, support all the benefits that they receive from being here. Uh, but you know, we, w we don't want to see this trend grow. Uh, we don't want uh, f uh, companies who uh, have up until now been playing by the rules, suddenly looking over their shoulder and saying, you know what, some of our competitors are 
uh, gaming the system, and we need to do it too. Uh, that kind of herd mentality, uh, I think, is, is something we want to avoid, so we want to move quickly, uh, as quickly as possible. Just to clarify, uh, the federal contracting seems like an area that uh, you've liked to, it's worked well for you on issues like promoting gay rights or um, contraception policy. Is, is it fair to assume that that would, attaching this to federal contractors would be the, the first thing you would think yeah. of? Margaret, I'm not going to uh, uh, announce specifics in dribs and drabs. Uh, when we've done a thorough evaluation and we understand what our authorities are, uh, I'll let you know. Uh, Chris Jansen, NBC News. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Russia said today that it is going to ban uh, food and agricultural product imports. That was about $1.3 billion last year. At the same time, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel said that the massing of troops along the border of Ukraine increases the likelihood of an invasion. Are sanctions not working? Uh, well, we don't know yet whether sanctions are working. Sanctions are working as intended in putting enormous pressure and strain on the Russian economy. Uh, that, that's not my estimation. If you look at the markets and you look at estimates in terms of capital flight, uh, if you look at uh, projections for Russian growth, what you're seeing is that the economy has ground to a halt. Somewhere between 100 and 200 billion dollars of capital flights have taken place. You're not seeing a lot of investors coming in uh, new to uh, start uh, uh, businesses inside of Russia. Uh, and it has presented the choice to President Putin as to whether he is going to try to resolve uh, the issues in East eastern Ukraine through diplomacy uh, and peaceful means, recognizing that Ukraine is a sovereign country, uh, and that uh, it is up ultimately to the Ukrainian people to make decisions about their own lives, uh, or alternatively continue on the course that he's on, in which case uh, he's going to be hurting his economy uh, and hurting his own people over the long term. Uh, and in that sense, we are doing exactly what we should be doing. Uh, and we're very uh, pleased that uh, our European allies and partners joined us uh, in this process, as well as a number of countries uh, around the world. Um, having said all that, the issue is not resolved yet. You still have fighting in eastern Ukraine. Uh, civilians are still dying. Uh, we've already seen uh, some of the consequences uh, of this conflict in uh, the loss of the Malaysian Airlines uh, uh, airline uh, or jetliner. Uh, and uh, the sooner that we can get back on a track in which uh, there are serious discussions taking place to assure that all Ukrainians are heard, that they can work through the political process, that they're represented, uh, that the reforms that have already been offered uh, by uh, the government in Kiev are implemented uh, to protect Russian speakers, uh, to assure decentralization of power, uh, the sooner that we move on those, uh, and the sooner that President Putin recognizes that, uh, you know, Ukraine is an independent country, uh, you know, it's only at that point where we can say that the problem's truly been solved. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, sanctions are working the way they're supposed to. The, tro the troops that are massing on the border are more highly trained. They seem to have more sophisticated weaponry, according to intelligence. Does that make you reconsider, as a few Democrats have suggested, uh, providing lethal aid to Ukraine? given those troop movements? Well, keep in mind that uh, the Russian army is a lot bigger than the Ukrainian army. So uh, the issue here uh, is not whether the Ukrainian army has some additional weaponry. Um, at least up until this point, they've been fighting a group of separatists who have engaged in some terrible violence, uh, but who can't match uh, the Ukrainian army. Now, if you start seeing a, a, an invasion by Russia, uh, that's obviously a different uh, set of questions. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, what we have been doing is providing uh, a, a whole host of uh, uh, assistance packages to the Ukrainian government uh, and to their military. Uh, and uh, we will continue to work with them 
to evaluate on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis what exactly they need uh, in order to be able to defend their country and to deal with uh, the, uh, the separatist elements that currently are being armed uh, by Russia. But the, the best thing we can do for Ukraine is uh, to try to get back on a political track. David uh, Ojito, The Standard. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you've been hosting African kings prime ministers and presidents for the last three days. But back home in Africa, media freedom is under threat. The work of journalists is becoming increasingly difficult. In Egypt, our Al Jazeera colleagues are in jail. In Ethiopia, dozens of journalists are in prison. In Kenya, they have passed very bad laws targeting the media. What can the international community do to ensure that we have a strong media in Africa, and more importantly, to secure the release of the journalists who are behind bars. And two, so many countries in Africa are facing threats of terror. I'm glad you've mentioned a few uh, measures you're gonna take, but what can the international community do also to neutralize terror threats in Mali, Cameroon, Nigeria, Kenya? Could that be the reason you have skipped Kenya in your visits to Africa? Thank you. I'm sorry, what was the last part of the question? Uh, could the terror threats be the reason you have skipped Kenya in your visits to Africa? Oh, no, 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 no. The, uh, well, f first of all, with respect to the journalists and the media, uh, the last session that we had on uh, good governance uh, emphasized that uh, good governance means everybody has a voice, that government is transparent, and thereby accountable. And even though leaders don't always like it, the media plays a crucial role uh, in assuring people that uh, they have the proper information to evaluate uh, the policies that their leaders are pursuing. Uh, and so we have been very consistent in pushing governments, not just in Africa, but around the world, uh, to respect uh, the right of journalists to practice their trade uh, as a critical part of civil society and a critical part of uh, any democratic uh, norm. Um, you know, the specific uh, issue of the Al Jazeera journalists in Egypt, uh, we've been clear both publicly and privately that they should be released. Uh, and, you know, we ha have been troubled by uh, some of the laws that have been passed around the world that seem to restrict uh, the ability of, of journalists to pursue stories or write stories. Uh, we've also been disturbed by uh, efforts to control the Internet. Part of what's happened uh, uh, over the last uh, decade or two is that uh, the new media, new technology, uh, allow people to get information that previously uh, would have never been accessible or only to uh, a few specialists. And, and now people can punch something up on the Internet and, and pull up uh, information that's, uh, that's relevant to their own lives and, and their own societies and communities. So uh, we're going to continue to push back against these efforts, uh, as is true uh, on a whole range of issues. Uh, and I've said this in the past. Um, you know, many times we will work with countries even though they're not perfect on every issue. Uh, and uh, we find that uh, in some cases engaging a country that generally is a good partner but uh, is not performing optimally uh, uh, when it comes to uh, all the various categories of human rights, uh, you know, that we can be effective by working with them on certain areas and uh, criticizing them and, and uh, trying to uh, elicit improvements uh, in other areas. Uh, and even among countries that generally have strong human rights records, there are, uh, there are areas where there are problems. That's true of the United States, by the way. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and so um, the, the, the good news, and we heard this in the summit, is that more and more countries are recognizing that in the absence 
of good governance in the absence of accountability and transparency. Uh, that's not only going to have an effect domestically on the legitimacy of, of a government. It's going to have an effect on uh, economic development and growth um, because, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, in an information age, open societies uh, have the capacity to innovate uh, and uh, educate and move faster uh, and, and uh, be part of the global marketplace uh, uh, more than uh, closed societies do over the long term. I believe that. Now, now, with respect to terrorism, I think there's uniform concern uh, of terrorist infiltration in many countries uh, throughout Africa. Obviously, this is a concern that we have globally. Uh, a lot of the initiatives that we put forward were designed to partner so that countries, first and foremost, can deal with these problems uh, within their own borders uh, or regionally. And uh, the United States doesn't have a desire to expand and create a big footprint inside of Africa. What we do want to make sure uh, we can do is partner with uh, the African Union, with ECOWAS, with individual countries to build up their capacity. And one of the encouraging things uh, in the sessions was a recognition that uh, fighting terrorism also requires security forces that are professional, that are disciplined, that themselves are not engaging in human rights violations, that uh, part of the lesson that we've all learned about terrorism is that uh, you know, it is possible in reaction to terrorism to actually accelerate the disease uh, if uh, the response uh, is one that alienates populations or particular ethnic groups or particular religions. Uh, and so uh, the work that we're doing, in, including the security initiatives that I announced today, uh, I think can make a, a big difference in that direction. It's not just a matter of us providing better equipment uh, or better training. Uh, that's a part of it. But part of it is also making sure that uh, th these uh, security forces uh, and the intelligence operations are coordinated uh, and uh, professional and are not alienating populations. Uh, the more we do that, the more effective we can be. Last point I'll make is on good governance. One of the best inoculators against terrorist infiltration is a society in which everybody feels as if they have a stake in the existing order and they feel that their grievances can be resolved through political means rather than through violence. Uh, and, and so that's just one more reason why uh, good governance has to be part of the, re uh, the recipe uh, that uh, we use for uh, a, a strong, stable, and prosperous Africa. Uh, last question, uh, Jerome uh, uh, Cartilli. Uh, Cartilia. Thank you, Mr. Jerome. President. Earlier today, Israeli Prime Minister uh, described the Gaza operation as justified and proportionate. Do you agree with these two words? And uh, Israel and Hamas seems to be at odds over prolonging the ceasefire. Are you hopeful a ceasefire, a, a, a true ceasefire, can be achieved? And what exact role can the U.S. play in the current talks going on in Cairo? Uh, I have said from the beginning that no country would tolerate rockets being launched into their cities. And uh, as a consequence, uh, I have consistently supported Israel's right to defend itself, and that includes uh, doing what it needs to do to prevent rockets from landing uh, on population centers, uh, and uh, more recently, as we learned, uh, preventing tunnels from being dug under their territory uh, that can be used uh, to launch terrorist attacks. Uh, I also think it is important to remember that Hamas uh, acts extraordinarily irresponsibly when it is deliberately citing rocket launchers in population centers, um, you know, putting populations at risk because of that particularly, particular military strategy. Uh, now, Having said all that, uh, I've also expressed uh, my distress at what's happened to uh, innocent civilians, uh, including women and children, uh, during the course of uh, this process. And I'm very glad that we have at least temporarily achieved a ceasefire. The question now is how do we build uh, on uh, this, this temporary cessation of violence? 
uh, and move forward in a sustainable way. Uh, we intend to support the process that's taking place in Egypt. Uh, I think the short-term goal has to be uh, to uh, make sure that rocket launches do not resume, that the work that the Israeli government did in, in uh, closing off these tunnels uh, has been completed, uh, and that uh, we are now in the process of helping to rebuild uh, a Gaza that's been uh, really uh, badly damaged uh, as a consequence of uh, uh, this, uh, this conflict. Long term, there has to be a recognition that uh, Gaza cannot sustain itself permanently, closed off from the world, uh, and incapable of providing some opportunity, jobs, economic growth for the population that lives there, particularly given how dense that population is, uh, uh, how young that population is, uh, we're going to have to see a shift in uh, opportunity uh, for the people of Gaza. Uh, I have no sympathy for Hamas. Uh, I have great sympathy for ordinary people who are struggling uh, uh, within Gaza. Uh, and the question then becomes, can we find a formula in which Israel has greater assurance that Gaza will not be a launching pad for further attacks, perhaps more dangerous attacks as technology develops uh, into their uh, country. But at the same time, the ordinary Palestinians have some prospects uh, for uh, an opening of Gaza so that they don't, do not feel walled off uh, and incapable of uh, pursuing uh, basic prosperity. Uh, I, I think there are formulas that are available, but they're going to require risks uh, on the, the part of uh, political leaders. They're going to require uh, a slow rebuilding of trust, which is obviously very difficult uh, in the aftermath of, of the kind of violence that we've seen. Uh, so I don't think we get there right away. Uh, but the U.S. goal right now would be to make sure that the ceasefire holds. Uh, that Gaza can be uh, uh, can can begin the process of rebuilding, uh, and that some measures are taken uh, so that uh, the the, uh, uh, the the people of uh, of Gaza feel some sense of hope, uh, and the people of Israel feel confident that they're not going to have uh, a repeat of the kind of uh, uh, rocket launches that we've seen uh, over the last uh, uh, several weeks. Um, and Secretary Kerry uh, has been in consistent contact with all the parties involved. Uh, we expect uh, we will continue to be uh, trying to uh, work uh, as diligently as we can uh, to, to move uh, the process forward. It is also going to need uh, to involve uh, the Palestinian leadership uh, in the West Bank. Uh, I have no sympathy for Hamas. I have great sympathy for uh, some of the work that has been done uh, in cooperation with Israel and the international community by uh, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and they've shown themselves to be responsible. They have, uh, it, they have recognized Israel. Uh, they are prepared uh, to move forward uh, uh, to, to arrive at a two-state solution. Um, uh, I think uh, Abu Mazen is sincere in his desire for peace. Um, but they have also been weakened, I think, during this process. Uh, the populations in the West Bank may have lo also lost confidence or lost a sense of hope in terms of how to move forward. We have to rebuild that as well. Uh, and uh, they, they are the delegation that's uh, leading uh, the Palestinian uh, negotiators. Uh, and. Uh, my hope is, is that we'll be engaging with them to try to move uh, what has been a, a very tragic situation over the last several weeks into a more constructive uh, path. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you uh, all who participated in the Africa Summit. Uh, it was uh, an outstanding piece of work, and uh, I want to remind uh, folks, in case they've forgotten, of the incredible young people who participated in our uh, fellows program. We're very proud of you, and we're looking forward to seeing all the great things that you do when you go back home. All right? Thank you.